Greetings ladies and gentlemen and welcome to my Total War Warhammer 2 Potential High Elf Army Units videos. As with all of my army videos, this army list will be based off of the 8th edition of the tabletop game of Warhammer Fantasy Battle, as that is where Creative Assembly seem to have drawn most of their inspiration from in terms of drawing the units they've selected for Total War Warhammer. Before we kick things off, there's just a couple of rules that are maybe not specific to the High Elf Army, but apply to large areas of the High Elf Army, but aren't necessarily applicable in the direct translation over to Total War Warhammer. Now a very specific thing about the High Elves is that they often have the rule always strikes first. Now on the tabletop this would mean that units, High Elf units, would roll first to hit their opponent's uh, unit or regiment and then before the opponent was able to strike back at them. This isn't really translatable in Total War Warhammer and instead would probably present itself as high attack speeds for most of the units we're going to see in this High Elf army. A number of units also have a skill known as Valor of Ages which essentially translates as a morale buff against Dark Elf units. So bear in mind that a number of these guys might have that trait. Now that could be translated across to Total War Warhammer by just giving them a specific trait against Dark Elves that gives them higher leadership. So we'll have to wait and see if they implement that. But that's just a couple of rules to bear in mind for the upcoming army list of the High Elves. So let's kick things off with the army. Let's start off with the Lords or the Generals of the High Elf armies. The first of these Generals is the are the Princes of Ulf One. In terms of the law, they are known as having a very deep sense of honor, a mastery of diplomacy and the many forms of warfare. They dedicate their lives to pursuing precision in all things and feel that any life that doesn't follow this course is very much a hollow existence and maybe not worth doing. Now in terms of how they can be geared out and how they might play in Total War Warhammer 2, it's hard to say because there's a lot of options in terms of how you want to equip the princes in, in Warhammer. They can be armed with sword, with lance, with shield, with bow, with halberd. There's really a number of different variations but if I was to guess I'd say that Creative Assembly will implement these guys in very much a melee focused role or they might play very much like the Wood Elf Generals who you're able to switch between either you could have them focused on range or you could have them focused on melee attack and we might get that same amount of flexibility with the High Elf Prince Generals as well. So that would be an interesting aspect to take with these guys but I think these types of Lords are very much a lock for the starting version of Total War Warhammer 2. They also have um, as well as a huge variety of uh, weaponry they can use. They also have a large variety of mounts they can use. They can use Elven Steed, which are particularly quick horses in the Warhammer world. They have the choice of being mounted on a Great Eagle as well, or on a Griffin, or on a Chariot of Tyrannoch, which we'll get into a little bit later in terms of the specificity of that. Uh, in this video uh, or of course a dragon as pictured here. So all in all very capable lords, very quick, very focused, very dedicated and it's said that uh, some of the lords you can kind of role play a little bit in terms of what region they're from and their method of fighting. For example as I mentioned the Tyrannoch has a chariot and it said that princes from Tyrannoch tend to favor using the chariot whereas uh, princes from Lafern might prefer to be kitted out in the sort of spear and bow configuration. There's a lot of variety you can play about with and themes you can follow when setting up these kind of generals. But all in all, they can get magical items. We've seen these kind of generals before, and it'll very much fit into the mold of Total War Warhammer that we've seen so far in the game. The next generals up are the Arch Mages. Now these are very much the magic focused generals. We've seen these before in Total War Warhammer already. And the mages in the High Elf Army are very nimble minds, very deep understanding of the ways and magic, and are very important to High Elf society as a whole. It's said that without the mages, Ulf One would have sunk beneath the waves long ago and disappeared from the Warhammer world. 
But through magics, they're managing to, to sustain their island and keep it going and have many times been responsible for the defense of Ulfwan against particularly the forces of chaos. Each kingdom of Ulfwan has its own kind of magical traditions, but some of the best high elf mages are known to come from the area of Safari, where they study the eight laws of magic, and that's really only thought to be the beginning of their training. Once they've mastered all eight laws of magic, they then move on to pursue what the elves consider a higher form of magic, which is known as high magic, and the elves have access to this kind of magic as well. As well as being sort of powerful magic users, they also are considered sort of great counselors as well, and are known to have an almost transcendent kind of insight into all matters of state and warfare. So very handy, very powerful magic users, those are the arch mages of Ulfwan. Another type of general is the Anointed of Assyrian. Now the Anointed of, Sur of Assyrian are taken from the Phoenix Guard who are charged with guarding the Shrine of Assyrian. Now Assyrian is the head of the pantheon of elven gods and is thought to be by the elves responsible for their creation. And the Phoenix Guard dedicate themselves particularly to the teachings of this god and above the Phoenix Guard are the Anointed of Assyrian. Like the Phoenix Guard, they too have taken a vow of silence that is enforced with magic so you'll never hear them speak and they spend a lot of their time contemplating in what's known as the chamber of days within the temple of Assyrian. Now part of the reason for their vow of silence is that once you see the chamber of days there's said to be sacred writings of the wall that speaks of the past present and future and once you enter the room, you're given knowledge of your own death and things that will happen in the future. And thus you are sworn to silence so that you don't repeat these secrets. But it must be a heavy burden on the Phoenix Guard that many of them know the exact moment upon which they will meet their end. And the idea is that this is some kind of unspoken contract where the God Assyrian lends the Phoenix Guard some of his power so that they might be proficient and powerful on the battlefield. And in exchange, they dedicate their lives to serving Assyrian and serving the shrine itself. The anointed of Assyrian themselves tend to only ride out when it's said that destiny is at its tipping point. So in the most urgent of need, just when they need to be there, the anointed of Assyrian arrive on the battlefield with a host at their back. They have the protection of their god, so it's said that more blows that would have otherwise killed them are sometimes seemingly magically set aside, and dark sorceries collapse around them. In terms of some of their mounts, it's said the anointed of Assyrian that can mount a phoenix and they have resistance to magic and they also cause fear because obviously they have that vow of silence and I guess silent guys with massive halberds scare people. Now the idea with the being able to foretell the future plays into their tabletop rules as well a little bit. They have the witness to destiny which effectively gives them a 50% ward save on the tabletop version of the game. In terms of another rule the anointed Assyrian has is the blessing of Assyrian. This makes them immune to psychology and gives them and the unit they're in a 6 plus ward save. So for them they already have their 4 plus but if they're in a different unit that unit gets a 6 plus on a, on a 6 sided dice to save from any incoming wounds. So they get a chance. It adds an extra layer of protection this might in total war warhammer play out more as an aura effect because as you guys well know you can't insert generals into units in total war warhammer so that's probably more of an aura effect that maybe gives them a ward protection for units within a certain distance of this general and that about sums it up for the anointed of assyrian very much dedicated to their god he rewards them they become kick-ass flame inspired guys and do some good work on his behalf. So next up we have the Lawmaster of Hoth or Hoth. I'm not 100% sure on the correct correct pronunciation of that one. But they study in the Tower of Hoth where the Swordmasters of the same name hail from as well. But the tower isn't only a place to learn about the mastery of sword. You can also learn about art there, magic, all aspects of warfare. And it's rare for anyone to have the intellectual capability to pursue all of these paths. But the most gifted individuals do. And these guys become law masters. They find the sword mastery almost childish to overcome and learn. They just find it that easy. So they lend their focus to the grasps of magic lore as well. And although they don't specialize necessarily in battle magic, they kind of 
put a sliver of effort into that, but kind of study the subtler aspects of magic, as it's described in the lore. They tend not to master all the aspects of battle magic, but learn a few of the spells from each of the eight laws themselves. But this kind of dedication and intellectual prowess is often said to leave the lore masters slightly eccentric, so they can be a bit odd at times. But all in all, the spells they tend to master, at least what they're able to pick on the tabletop version of the game, is the idea that they have learned all the signature spells of the Eight Laws of Magic. So, to give you guys, if you don't know already, the Eight Laws of Magic that we've seen in Total War Warhammer already, you know, metal, uh, fire, that kind of thing, all have a signature spell on the tabletop where they're usually, I think they're, ra they're usually randomly selected, and you can choose to swap out one of your spells for the signature spell and these are known as just the signature spells of the law of magic and the law masters have access or are said to know all of them so they have the option of having access to the signature spells and being such skilled swordsmen as well it said they're also able to knock arrows out of the sky coming towards them which gives them a ward save against shooting or against non-magical shooting so they can kind of just ward off some arrows because they are such kick-ass swordsmen and these guys are very much a combination of uh, melee focused lords with aspects of magic about them as well so a very interesting and very different kind of general that could be uh, represented in total war warhammer i mentioned in another video that i don't necessarily believe that the law masters will make it as a starting general in total war warhammer i think they might actually come on later on in one of the dlc packs but we'll have to wait and see but it's a very interesting new element for the high elf army for this very melee focused magic caster who's not necessarily a legendary lord and can be a, just a generic type of general and that about sums it up for our lords in the high elf army moving on to the heroes we have the noble who's very much kind of the downgraded version of the princes so you have the princes who are the generals you have the nobles who are the heroes very much like the generals and captains of the empire in total war warhammer one very similar concept we know how this how the upgrade tree for the nobles may very well go you'll have training you'll have exemplar you'll have them be able to drive down recruitment cost one imagines they'll very much uh, fill that role and they have a choice of different mounts as well including the tyrannoch chariot the griffin the eagle the elven steed but these guys don't have the option of picking a dragon for a mount just something worth bearing in mind for the nobles now like the nobles we have the mages who are kind of just the step down on the rung from the arch mages that we saw earlier again very powerful with magic very adept and good magic users as we've seen before in total war warhammer already these are going to be the magic users for the high elves there's also a unit known as the dragon mages now whereas the mages for the high elves often have the abilities to draw spells from multiple laws of magic the dragon mages go through a kind of initiation the dragon mages tend to hail from kalador the region very well known for its dragons and where most of the dragons of ulf one come from and they are said to go through be studying magic and at some point they have a vision and in this vision they envisage blood and flame and fire and see themselves riding upon the back of a dragon the color of the setting sun and it's said that whenever a mage has this kind of vision they wake up almost a changed person they become less patient less uh, calm shall we say more impetuous it's said that at this stage their studies into magic have effectively finished for they no longer have the temperament to master all the laws of magic and at this point are forced to focus only on the law of fire they then go on a quest to collect the dragon they saw in their vision and they go to the sulfur dogged caverns uh, below the mountains of Kalador though it said that many can never rouse a sleeping dragon these dragon mages are said to be able to do it with a simple whisper and they form a bond with that dragon that lasts until death so these are mages who are able to have dragons as mounts particularly powerful heroes if you think of that upgrade that, that's open to them but they only have the mastery of the one law of magic so an interesting kind of give and take there for the dragon mages of course once they are mounted on the dragon the dragon causes terror in terms of some of their special rules they have a special rule called uh, reckless 
which gives them a plus two bonus to casting uh, when you're rolling dice to cast a spell on the tabletop. What that would be in terms of an adequate translation in Total War Warhammer would be maybe a reduction in the cost of the lore of magic they use. That'd be very interesting if their spells just cost a little bit less, maybe by one uh, wind of magic value or something like that, than for any other wizard of the lore of fire. That would be an interesting compromise. I think that's a good way to accurately translate that rule. They also have a rule called Warrior Mage, which would effectively mean that whatever spell they pick first, uh, in terms of when they pick spells on the tabletop, they'd get Flaming Sword of Ruin. Now, this element of selecting magical spells doesn't really play in Total War Warhammer, so that might actually have the effect Perhaps in Total War Warhammer, what you could do is have an aura around the Dragon Mage where the Flaming Sword of Rune effects are always going on, or maybe a constant around them. That could be an interesting element to add. So you're in, almost encouraged to get the Dragon Mage near combat, if not into the thick of combat itself, giving all the other units around them the Flaming Damage attack that the Flaming Sword of Ruin enables them to have. So that's the Dragon Mage. Next up, we have the Sea Helms. These are the greatest heroes of the princedom of Lafern. And, and these guys are trained to fight at sea, fight on land. They're equally happy at both. They're an order founded by the Phoenix King, Belshinar. They're equally happy fighting with spear or bow. And they're said to be so accurate, they have a silk quicksilver strike which allows them to kind of bypass shields and parrying abilities and really just get their hits in on their enemies. These are more often than not found within the ranks of the Lafern Sea Guard, and they are in fact the best of their number. But in Total War Warhammer, we know you don't put heroes into units, so they'd be very much kind of on individual units. They can, if their mount, have a chariot known as the Sky Cutter, which we'll get to a little bit later on in this video. But they do have a few special rules when they are on this Sky Cutter, so I imagine in Total War Warhammer, they will be provided with that option as a mount, and that will perhaps allow them to have an extra buff. On the tabletop, they would get a ward save to shots against them in the Sky Cutter mount, and that could be translated over to Total War Warhammer as well. And that about sums it up for the Sea Helms, really. Just the best of the best of the, the Lafern Sea Guard, very much kind of the marines shall we say of the high elf army moving on we have the handmaidens now the handmaidens are an elite group of female warriors who are dedicated to the protection of the ever queen there are always a hundred of them at the time and they are picked from the best of the sisters of avalon who are themselves the most gifted female warriors picked from the citizens of ulf one they are very much a warrior guard equally adept at spear and bow and they have a special rule which is quick to fire which in total war warhammer will essentially translate as they can fire their arrows while moving but these would be a very interesting option in terms of both a skirmishing and melee focused hero so that's a very interesting element for the handmaidens who protect the ever queen there they also have a reverence which is effectively a buff that they can give to units around them as well the idea being that if anyone sees the handmaidens they know that the will of the ever queen is with them and so are uplifted by that notion all in all the handmaidens are sort of drafted in for seven years of service and after those seven years they're kind of asked do you want to go back to your old life or do you want to continue to dedicate yourself to the ever queen but there is an out at some point but they have that sort of mandatory seven years that they have to serve as a handmaiden once they are selected so moving on from the hero units let's have a look at the infantry in the high elf army we are going to start off with the militia archers now the civilian militia of Ulfwan was started by the phoenix king morvael the impetuous now what this phoenix king did was perceived as rather foolish in historical perspective the dark elves who had been chased off of Alfwan were thought to be at a weakened state and morvael thinking this sent the entire high elf army across the ocean to destroy Nagaroth once and for all. Little did he know that in all the years the Dark Elves had been relatively quiet, 
they'd actually been completely rebuilding their entire armies and crushed the High Elf army as it arrived on their shores. Now, expecting a counterattack, the High Elves were absolutely boned. They didn't have an outstanding army to fight the Dark Elves off with, and indeed, Malekith led an invasion of Ulfwan. Morvael, in an act of desperation more than anything, then formed the civilian militia. Now, over the many years of this war with the Dark Elves on the shores of Ulfwan, this militia eventually started to get more and more experienced, and to cut a long story short, eventually managed to fight Malekith off of Ulfwan once again. In the time, they'd become a very experienced militia with their own traditions and ways of doing things, and the tradition of this militia continues on in Ulfwan to this day. They really do now form the cornerstone of many High Elf armies. The first skills they master when you're enlisted into the militia nowadays is you master the bow and you master the sword. Once these are mastered, you are then awarded the rank of being able to enter into the militia proper where you earn your white garb. Now the white garb of the archer regiment is earned and is representative of the color of purity in high elf society and the color of death. The idea is that the white garb of the archers of Ulfwan represents their willingness to fight until the bitter end for their home. All in all, once you join the militia, you are enlisted for 10 years, and this is how you sort of live out your service to Ulfwan in High Elf society. Once you've completed 10 years, you are then allowed to continue on the militia, but you're upgraded to training with the spear and shield. At that point, you become a militia spearman. These are the living ramparts that hold the line for many high elf armies, and they're so used to working together and drilled so much that they have an almost instinctive level of understanding between themselves and their comrades. Now, you do get upgraded versions of both the archers, who are known as Hawkeyes, and the spearmen, which are known as sentinels, we may see an implementation of that in Total War Warhammer 2, but for the most part, these will be kind of like your bog standard troops that make up the majority of at least your early armies in Total War Warhammer. The spearmen will probably come in a shielded and unshielded variety, were I to guess, but you never know, they might just come with the only shielded variety in the game to come. They're quick, they're agile, their armor is relatively light, but still fairly durable, so it gives them an, a, an iota of flexibility. But that's the militia spearmen, very skilled, but still just the civilian militia of the high elf armies, and as, as it said in the description the backbone of many of those armies so moving on from the militia spearmen we have kind of an upgrade which is the lafern sea guard now these guys are the troops who fight on the uh, famous navies of the high elves they fight on deck they fight on land they're equally adept at doing both they have a very flexible but light armor to allow them the flexibility of you know climbing masts jumping aboard other enemy ships doing all kinds of things that the Sea Guard need to do. They fight with spear, shield, and bow, and this makes them a very interesting unit as far as Total War Warhammer is concerned. They could be firing across and then brace themselves in time for a charge from an oncoming enemy. Now, this makes them a very interesting proposition in how Total War Warhammer handles that. Do they make it a formation stance change when they go from bows to bracing against a charge? How do they handle that? And as with all spears, apart from gobos in Total War Warhammer, they probably will have a bonus versus large. But I'm looking forward to see how these guys are implemented, because I think tactically they could be a truly fascinating unit, just being able to put archers on the front line and have them be, be effective spearmen at the same time allows a huge degree of flexibility for tactics in Total War Warhammer 2. And although they aren't necessarily an elite unit, they're one of the units I'm actually looking most forward to seeing implemented in the game, because I think they really do add something fairly distinctive as a unit in Total War Warhammer. Now, these guys have an upgraded form known as the Sea Masters, and that name might be brought into Total War Warhammer 2 a little bit later on, or as an upgrade path for the Lafern Sea Guard. But really a fascinating unit, archers who can hold their own, hold the line, and act as very effective spearmen as well. So moving on from the Lafern 
guard, we have the White Lions of Kreis. Now the history now the history of the White Lions would start just before the coronation of Calidor the First as Phoenix King of Ulfwan. Calidor at the time was the prince of just Calidor, and he he got word from messengers that he'd been selected as the next Phoenix King. So he immediately saw packed up all his stuff and made his way to the shrine of Asurian where the phoenix kings are coronated. So he set off on his travels with his uh, sort of normal guards, and they went down on the road to the shrine of Assyrian. They were, however, ambushed by a group of dark elf assassins who promptly dispatched all of Kalidor's guards and were about to run him through. Suddenly, out of the woods emerged huntsmen crates, armed with their axes, which they're so legendarily known for. They charged through defended the future phoenix king and dispatched all of the dark elf assassins they agreed to escort him safely to the temple of assyrian and upon walking through the fires of assyrian calador named this group of huntsmen as the white lions of Kreis, and that they would forever act as the bodyguard of the phoenix king to be initiated into this elite group of fighters an elf has to have shown huge gifts in the martial prowess upon the battlefield not just in the classroom or in the training ground but they have to be battled hardened veterans who are renowned fighters in order to be accepted into this elite regiment they also have to go through a rite of passage whereby they have to single-handedly hunt down one of the white lions of Kreis. and these animals are huge they're not the lions you and i know they match they're about the height of a horse sort of from the shoulder and they are fierce with a single swipe they've been known to snap a man's spine and it's not easy to put one of these things down so they have to go through this test of skill hunt down and kill one of these huge lions and at that point they skin it wear its fur which not only is you know quite decorative and looks pretty good but also is actually quite good protection against arrows and things like that. It's a very thick hide. Every Phoenix King, once they come into power, often offer the White Lions a different weapon. The axe is considered slightly uh, crass, maybe a, perhaps a commoner's weapon, but the White Lions wouldn't have it any other way. Many of their axes are heirlooms from their fathers and their fathers' fathers who have served in the regiments, and they are truly lethal with them. The axes themselves are known to be almost incomprehensibly sharp and able to fell trees and enemies with a single swipe. So they are truly deadly, despite not maybe being considered the best of terms in elven society. Now, the White Lions of Kreis have the ability Stubborn, which essentially would mean in Total War Warhammer they have very high leadership, and they have the ability Forest Strider, which on the tabletop would mean that they don't have to take dangerous terrain tests, so it just means they get across terrain easier. And this is kind of going to their sort of history as huntsmen and woodsmen, but essentially this would mean they don't slow down, maybe going across rougher terrain, like other units do, or maybe in Total War Warhammer they might also give them a boost to Vigor, just to kind of enforce that point a little bit, perhaps. That's the White Lions of Kreis, and next up we have the Sword Masters of Hoeth. Now we've mentioned the T Tower of Hoth, or Hoeth, uh, before in dealing with the Law Masters, but the Sword Masters, even though not being as gifted as the Law Masters, are still masters of martial skill. They dedicate their lives to perfecting their martial ability and their skills at warfare. They spend decades, if not centuries, studying their martial skills and truly emerge as masters of their art. They're said to be able to kill with a single touch or even end the man's life with a high-pitched whistle delivered in the right tone. That's how skilled they are at the art of killing. It's said that the sword masters are so talented that the only time anyone can be exposed to their true skill is during war when they can practice the art of killing unfettered, unrestricted by the bounds of safety or by the risk of hurting their fellow elves. So they just let their skills show and they are a blur of steel and blood on the battle field they smack arrows out of the sky with a adept skill and they slice enemies in two in bloody sprays the great swords they wield are forged beneath the tower of hearth itself by the smiths there who are said to be the envy of the priests of vol and vol's kind of like the smithy god of the elven people 
And these blades, although being huge, they're said to be as long as an elf is tall. They're light as a feather. They're just that perfectly balanced, allowing the truly skilled sword masters to make the most of their abilities on the battlefield. In terms of special rules for the Swordmasters, they get the benefit of the same rule as the Lawmaster of Hoeth in terms of being able to deflect shooting attacks. So although they don't have shields, they are quite adept and so in total War Warhammer will probably have a resistance to missile attacks as a great sword unit. Which is fairly handy for a unit like this to be fair. So moving on from the Swordmasters we have the Shadow Warriors. Now the Shadow Warriors were founded when Malekith's betrayal had been revealed and Nagarith was split among those loyal to Malekith and those loyal to the rest of Ulfwan. And it was the Shadow Warriors who were the representatives of the Loyalists. And being outnumbered and being most susceptible to the fire and madness of what had become of the Princeton of Nagarith, that they had to set about different ways of warfare and really just trying to survive in this harsh landscape behind enemy lines. They began to use ambushes, they began to find particular hiding places in the lands that would become known later as the Shadowlands and they became masters at guerrilla warfare. Their ancestors continue that tradition to this day and those are what make up the ranks of the Shadow Warriors. Among their traditions they try and preserve the ways of old Nagarif before it was perverted by the lessons of Malekith and his mother Marathi. And they stand ceaseless vigil against any further dark elf incursions into their territory and are driven by an almost boundless hate towards their dark elf brethren. However, this kind of cruel and gorilla-like and almost nefarious way of warfare has put them under the suspicion of the rest of Ulfwan as they see their way of warfare as being particularly cruel and so sometimes these shadow warriors are looked down upon in the rest of Ulfwan society but their loyalty has so far always stayed true to the phoenix throne. They've known many a time to appear seemingly out of nowhere laying down volleys of arrow fire upon the flanks of dark elf armies or any other armies that are threatening Ulfwan at the time. They managed to strike down many enemy sorcerers with their black fletched arrows and essentially these guys are somewhat of the hidden fist of the high elf army. These guys will probably get Stork in Total War Warhammer. They may also get Snipe, which is the ability to have range on an enemy and be able to fire at them without them knowing where you are. Now, obviously, with a human player, that has limited uses because they'll be able to see where the arrows are coming from. But against the AI, it's a particularly interesting skill to have. And yeah, these guys would be very interesting to have on campaign. They'll have hatred against Dark Elf, so it will be particularly uh, effective against them. They will also, yeah, be able to fire on enemies, sneak around the flanks, just get into really great positions for shooting and just taking enemies from different angles and different positions. Much like the Rangers work for the Dwarves at the moment, but obviously being Elves, they'll be much quicker than Dwarven Rangers. And it'll, we'll wait and see whether the Elves carry over the range bonus they got that the wood elves were given so if they have that extended range as well it will make them really quite a useful and deadly unit to be able to just lay down fire from unseen vantage points on any enemy armies and that will make them a hugely effective unit as the shadow warriors and they can somewhat handle themselves in melee as well so moving on from the shadow warriors we have the phoenix guard one of if not the most elite unit in the high elf army now the Phoenix Guard, as I mentioned in the Anointed of Assyrian, are the guardians of the Shrine of Assyrian. And they too spend some time in the Chamber of Day seeing the future and so are bound to this vow of silence. But they are given a portion of Assyrian's power, making them truly deadly and terrifying fighters. They provoke fear on the battlefield. They have a witness to destiny, the idea that seen the writings in the Chamber of Days and can foretell things, and that gives them a ward save of 50% on the tabletop. But I imagine they might turn that down for Total War Warhammer 2, but still give them a ward save of some kind. The only one they're loyal to is the Phoenix King, so they only obey his orders. They're not at the beck and command of your average general, let's say. So he tells them to go, or they kind of get a sense of where they're needed. The Phoenix Guard are armed with halberds, and they have heavy armor, but they don't uh, have shields or anything like that. 
So they'll probably be have some degree of armor piercing in Total War Warhammer, as well as an anti-large bonus and a charge defense bonus. So that's kind of how I see the Phoenix Guard playing out in Total War Warhammer 2. And next up, we have the Sisters of Avalon, dedicated to the Ever Queen. Now, the Sisters of Avalon, as we spoke about when we spoke about the Handmaidens, are picked from the militia citizenry of Ulfwan, but they're really just the best of the best female fighters. They guard certain areas of Avalon, which is where the Ever Queen resides. Um, mostly for some reasons because they involve rituals that the Ever Queen's involved in, and others because they've been so tainted by chaos, they don't want any elven citizens to happen to wander into that due into that area. And that's kind of their duties when war isn't currently going on. They are at the beck and call of the Ever Queen, and their weapons are actually sort of magical bolts. That So they'll probably do magical damage, and with each battle, they really do try and aspire to perfection, and they're just one of the most adept, if not the most adept, archers within Ulfwan's arm. So that's the Sis of Avalon, uh, servants of the Ever Queen, as torches defenders, and her representatives on the battlefield. So moving on from the Sisters of Avalon, we are moving into the area of cavalry. Now, the first type of unit we're going to look at are the Illyrian Reavers. Much like the White Lions, the Reavers were formed during the time of Kalidor, and there was a particular amount of turmoil in the land at the time. And Kaldor put out the call for skilled horsemen. Most of the horsemen that answered the call were from Illyrian, which was a renowned area for its fine horses and skilled riders. They began a campaign of harassment against the enemies of Ulfwan who were invading at the time. So they would ride in quick, strike, ride out again, hide out if they needed to, and just carried out a devastatingly effective campaign of guerrilla warfare all over Ulfwan. They would easily be able to sneak into enemy territory and they quickly earned the name of Reaver Knights. They would often live off the land, not necessarily needing to have traditional access to supply lines or anything like that, so they really could deep strike into enemy territory and escape from their once they'd hit or attack their target. They were so effective that after a while, Malekith, who was leading a campaign on Ulfwan at the time, began to not allow his troops to move in smaller numbers because it was almost a certainty that a group of these reavers would fall upon them and just completely destroy any kind of smaller regiments or units that were moving around. So they had to move in much larger forces, which hampered his war effort greatly. To this day, when peace is around, the Illyrian raiders tend to busy themselves by ridding Ulfwan of any animals or threats to the country or to the citizenry and are just kind of on patrol in the wilds of Ulfwan. They're truly a very effective quick cavalry and there's a amount of variety you can have to them so I see them playing out not dissimilarly to the yeoman of Bretonia in Total War Warhammer 2. They're able to equip spear and bow so that allows them to both strike and sort of be an effective quick cavalry uh, ride in, take out any missile units, and retreat, or be a skirmishing cav, and just fire bows at the enemy. Or they can be equipped with just spear or just bow. So there's kind of a mixture there, and I think that could maybe be an upgrade tree. You maybe start off with the two uh, options of the spear and of the bow, and then you upgrade to the unit that has both. That's the way I see it possibly playing out in Total War Warhammer 2. So a very interesting unit, very cool unit, quick cav. We've seen it before. We know how to use it in Total War Warhammer 2. So this is the high elf quick cav equivalent. Moving on, we have the Silver Helms. Now, the Silver Helms are exemplars of martial grace. They are very much kind of the soldiers that parents tell their children stories about. They completely embody the idea of elven nobility for many of the elves. They're not as aloof or as arrogant as the dragon riders, and they just kind of have this dashing element about them that seems to appeal to high elf society. Now, the ranks of the Silver Helms aren't made up of just normal citizens. You have to be of noble blood to be considered for the Silver Helms. They're not kind of regarded with the same, let's not say disdain, but perhaps suspicion of the Illyrian Reavers because they're considered a little bit too wild, whereas the Silver Helms are just noble and disciplined. And indeed, from the earliest of their training, the Silver Helms 
realms are taught not to look out for personal glory, but really to look out for the glory of the regiment, to stick together, to fight together as a cohesive unit, and it makes them truly effective cavalry. But like many elves, they are arrogant and tend to believe they can succeed no matter what the odds are against them, so they do suffer from that. Their steeds are geared up with, now forgive me if I mispronounce this, but Ethelrian barding which is a special kind of armor that the elves put on their horses which acts like barding of the empire but unlike the empire armor it's said to be as light as silk so it doesn't impede the movement of the elven steeds which allows them to be fairly quick now unusually the silver helms don't automatically come with shields in the tabletop game, the shields is an upgrade for the Silver Helms, so it'll be interesting to see if in Total War Warhammer they give you an unshielded version of these knights and maybe a shielded version, but that could be a possibility in Total War Warhammer 2 to look out for. So that's the uh, Silver Helms for you there. Next up, we have the arrogant uh, dragon princes of Kalidor, probably the most elite cavalry that the elves have. These guys are just supremely confident. They are the noble sons of Kalidor, whereas in days gone by when the dragons were at their fullest strength, these noble sons would most likely be upon the backs of dragons. But since dragons slumber so deeply and there are fewer and fewer of them in Ulfwan who are active at the time, and the gift of being able to wake them and bind them to you as a rider is kind of diluted as the bloodlines of Kalidor have been diluted, there are less and less dragons to ride. So they tend to go around in highly ornate armor that is reminiscent of the armor that they would have decorated their dragons in in centuries past. But now they ride upon steeds, but they are no less skilled at arms on a mount. Their armor and weaponry has been forged at Vol's Anvil and has been covered in enchantments. These guys are probably the most conceited of all the elven troops as well. Just supremely arrogant, and they're said they even pay little heed to orders at times. But this kind of arrogant facade is said to melt away when you see dragon princes in the midst of combat, and you can see at that moment their devotion to Ulfwan and their devotion to the defense of the elven people. But once the battle's over, it's very soon replaced by the arrogant, conceited visage they tend to carry around from day to day. These guys, like the Silver Helm, have their mounts covered in Ephilmar barding and they also wear dragon armor which gives them extra protection against flaming attacks so these guys would be particularly handy if you put them up against anything with flaming attacks and they get a save against that and have a very high armor value as well this is very much your heavy cavalry in the high elf army in terms of their armaments apart from the dragon armor they're also armed with shield and lance now there's a couple of ways that these guys could play out because there is speak of magical enchantments on their weaponry in total war warhammer 2 they may make this unit get do magic damage so moving on from the cavalry we have the chariots now we mentioned the tyrannoc chariot slightly earlier but this is kind of the most basic of of the elven chariots it's a very much a missile chariot although if it needs to get involved it can get involved in melee as well it's very quick it darts around the battlefield so the chariot riders are said to have a very adept skill at being able to find the tiniest cracks in enemy formations darting in there raining down arrows on them from the flank and from the rear darting out and escaping and just being very nimble and agile little chariot looking to wear down the enemy from afar but then charging in when need be at the last moment to break them or run them down so that's the Tyrannic chariot and the next chariot is the line chariot of Krace. this is a chariot ridden by white lions of Krace. now where they get their lions you may ask like who could possibly tame a white lion they're huge and indeed they are but what happens is when these guys are doing their test their right sometimes they happen upon a home or a den of a lion they kill the lion and find cubs and they don't leave the cubs to die they're not totally heartless so they adopt the cubs and raise them up to serve in Ulfwan's armies and these are the lions that make up the ones that pull their chariots they are gorgeous with their pleated manes and they cause fear, of course, because it's a lion the size of a horse charging at you with a chariot in behind, wielding two lunatics with massive axes. So they cause fear, 
They're also stubborn on the tabletop, which would essentially translate into having relatively high leadership in Total War Warhammer 2. And they could be potentially a devastating shock chariot that could do some real damage in close combat and melee. And would probably have one hefty charge bonus as well when they go into combat. The next chariot up is a little bit different. We've had the kind of light quick chariot. We've had the big devastating melee chariot. And next up we have the elven flying chariot. The Lafern sky cutter. Now these things are attached to a swift feather rock, uh, which isn't a great eagle, it's a different kind of bird. And they pull along the chariot, which is suspended in the air, not by the bird itself, but by kind of a magical cushion that lifts it and enables it to fly. Now this chariot can come in two forms that aren't really interchangeable as such, but it can come with a crew with no special attachment, so a crew of three I believe it is, or it can come with a crew of two and an eagle eye bolt thrower on it. And that will rain down arrows as well as bolts. And the crew themselves would be armed with bows. So very much kind of a more of a missile focused flying chariot this one. Uh, particularly when armed with the artillery piece. Now these guys are used a lot by the navies of Ulfwan to kind of scout out ahead of where the navy's going, get a read on the area, as well as with the armies. So very much kind of scouts not going to be diving in and getting involved with the melee. It's not really their ideal usage. So you can have the three crew or the two crew and the bolt thrower, or you can have them as a mount for the Sea Helms, who we mentioned earlier in the video, the uh, hero unit. So the Sea Helms can stride upon the chariot, but again, he'd be taking the place of two crew, so you can't have a Sea Helm in the tabletop at least, and the bolt thrower. You'd have to pick one or the other. So I see that kind of playing out, and we've seen this kind of unit before that can be a unit by itself in Total War Warhammer, but also be a mount for a hero unit. So that's how I see it being implemented in Total War Warhammer 2. So that's the Sky Cutter, very much a good harassing and haranguing unit, and if need me, can get involved in melee, particularly against missile units, just chasing them down, scaring them off. So that is the Lafern Sky Cutter. Next up, we're moving on to the monsters of the high elf army now we have a lot that we've seen before giant eagles i don't not gonna spend too much time on them we've seen them implemented with the wood elves they'll probably be exactly the same for the high elves the great eagles can also be mounts however for some of the heroes but there's not a unit in the high elf army that just sits on the back of eagles uh, by themselves as opposed uh, by a unit i mean sort of multiple characters you have heroes on them but not multiple characters. So that's the great eagles for you. So I imagine they'll probably be the non-ridden variety in the High Elf army. Although in the trailer, we did see people mounted on great eagles. And I imagine that will probably be generals or heroes that are mounted on great eagles in Total War Warhammer 2. You will probably have that option because we have seen it in the trailer. Next up, we have griffins. We've seen griffins. They've been in the game since the beginning. So griffins will be a mount option as well as possibly maybe an option just to ride in by themselves. But I doubt it. We'll probably just see them as mounts in Total War Warhammer 2. And now here's an interesting mount that does not appear in any other army. And this is the Flame Spire Phoenix. There are two variants of Phoenix, bear in mind, but the Flame Spire Phoenix makes their home in the alabaster pillars of the rock formations around the shrine of Assyrian, which we've mentioned a couple of times in this video, but the idea of sacred fire and things like that is very much tied to the god Assyrian himself. The Flame Spire Phoenixes are so attuned to the winds of magic that they're almost able to conjure fire magic at will. When they're enraged, their feathers explode and they become this flaming version of themselves when they're not happy with what's going on or they're being attacked or they're looking to defend something with their riders upon their back. Now the Phoenixes themselves are thought to be able to actually understand Elvish. So the, you're able to converse with them and bargain with them and indeed the anointed of Assyrian, the general unit we spoke about before, are able to talk to phoenixes and say, look buddy, can I use you as a mount in the upcoming war? Or do you want to help out my army and just join the ranks? You'd be particularly helpful. And the phoenixes can go along with it and be like, oh, okay, sure. Now, an issue with implementing the phoenixes in Total War Warhammer 2 is they have a number of elements of randomness about them. 
Now, we know that Creative Assembly don't like too much randomness. They allow for an element of it, but in Total War games, you kind of want to know that if you do something, it will get done. It just won't get done, or your piece of artillery will explode. And Creative Assembly have seemed to move away from the more random nature of the Warhammer game. So, here's the thing with the Flames by Phoenixes. They would have to roll a dice, and that would dictate certain ways they would play for that turn. So the Phoenixes also have a ward save, which is 33%. Now this ward save is also affected by the elements of randomness of the Phoenix. So on any given turn, a Phoenix can have a higher ward save or a lower ward save, or less strength, or more initiative, or more attacks, or more strength. There's a lot of variety to sort of what could happen in there. Stats would essentially fluctuate from turn to turn, only to a minimal degree of plus or one value on one attribute. But there was still an element of variation there. So I'm not sure how that element of the Phoenix gameplay will be translated. In fact, I doubt it will. I think they'll probably have solid stats. But it's just a point of interest for you guys who are taking up Total War Warhammer that on the Warhammer game, there's an element of variety that goes on every turn. And maybe it's the idea that Phoenix is kind of constantly in flux. Maybe that's the notion. The Phoenix also has a couple of other special rules. It has the special rule Fireborn, which makes it less susceptible to flaming attacks itself. Its attacks, of course, are flaming. It causes terror because it's a bird on fire. It's a firebird charging at you. I'd be terrified. It also has an ability called Wake of Fire. When it on the tabletop, it moves over a unit or several units. It can pick a unit and have a flaming attack rain down on them. Now, and this could be implemented in Total War Warhammer. I see very much as a uh, bombardment attack, kind of similar to the Gyro Bomber. Now... If you wanted to stick strictly to the law, that's kind of what it would be. You'd have to be going over a unit to have this effect and kind of rain down from the Phoenix itself, or that's the idea. But maybe in Total War Warhammer 2, what they do is they make it just a magical kind of bombardment spell that you can cast around the Phoenix within a certain radius. We could see an implementation either way, either making it a bombardment directly from the bird, so you'd have to have the bird go directly over a unit, which I think is probably the fairer uh, interpretation of the rule, or you could have it cast within a certain range. Those would be your two options. Now, as I mentioned, the Phoenix can resurrect itself, and this again enters the element of randomness in Warhammer that the Phoenix has going for it. So every turn, once the Phoenix was dead, and its rider can come back as well, You'd roll a six-sided dice, and on a one or two, the Phoenix was just dead forever, along with the Rider. They just wouldn't be able to come back. On a three to five, the spot where the Phoenix died would erupt into flame and do damage on anything that was on top of that spot. And there's still the opportunity to resurrect at that stage, but it would have to be next turn. And on a six, the Phoenix and the Rider would resurrect. So, I have no idea really how they're going to implement that in total war warhammer 2 whether they just put the resurrection on a cooldown and say where the phoenix died there's just an eternally like bubbly spot of flame that you want to avoid and if, you, if it happens just to land on an enemy at the time it dies it will kind of just have a continuous attack effect on that enemy until it is resurrected but I don't know how you make it a rough shot that the Phoenix just won't come back sometimes, and sometimes it does. That seems a bit too random for Total War Warhammer for me. So what I'm guessing they're going to do is make it that the Phoenix always resurrects after a certain amount of time. So you kill the Phoenix, it goes down, there's a area of flame where it went down, and that will do damage to friendly or enemy units who walk across it. And after a certain amount of time... The Phoenix will come back, maybe with a reduced life or something like that. Maybe with a reduced amount of hit points and be able to have an effect on the battlefield once more. That's really the only way I can see them implementing it in any way that makes sense to a Total War game. It's just that this is what happens every time you kill a Phoenix. It goes down, you want to avoid the spot it goes down on. Or if you're a clever Phoenix player, you make sure that the Phoenix goes down on a spot where your enemy's locked in combat and just eviscerates an entire regiment on the spot. But that's how I see it implemented. So that's the Flame Spire Phoenix. It's a very interesting unit. And bear in mind, it's very possible to have this not just as a mount. So it is a mount for, anoint for the Anointed of Assyrian, but it can also just act by itself. Now, I don't want to see them put other troops on it because I don't think any other troops can use it as a mount except for the Anointed. So... I do hope they have the variety where it is a mount, and when it's just a unit, it's a unit without a rider. 
that's how I hope to see it implemented in Total War Warhammer 2. So that's the first type of Phoenix for you. That's the Flame Spire Phoenix. Now, as Phoenixes get older, they begin to get a lot colder. And this allows starts to have them sapping heat energy, not only from themselves and their own body, but from the environment around them, leading to a chilling effect all around the Frost Heart Phoenix. Now, this chilling effect gets so severe that as they're living in the flame spires around the Shrine of Asurian, once this effect becomes too powerful, it actually starts to cause harm against the flame spire phoenixes. They start to suffer because this cold is affecting them. They don't, they don't like cold. They like fire and burning and all that good stuff. So the cold frost heart phoenixes tend to leave the area and just sort of disappear off for a few years. Now some of them choose to find a nice spot, live their life on the coast, and eventually become this kind of frozen statue of ice that I assume doesn't really melt. And they leave these kind of very eerie uh, silhouettes on the coastline of Ulfwan. Others tend to return to the Shrine of Assyrian and say, look, I'm towards the end of my life now anyway, I may as well serve for a mount in warfare and really help the elven people out and serve in war and start to make a use of myself before I die. Now, the Frostheart Phoenixes cannot resurrect. They lose that ability in their old age, which is slightly strange if you think about it, but there you go. So the Frostheart Phoenixes can't resurrect themselves. But on the whole, they have higher stats than the normal Phoenix. So they have more armor. The idea is that an ice sheet forms around them almost, providing them with armor. So they're more heavily armored. They have more attacks. They have higher leadership. They have a number of attributes that are higher. I think the only attribute that isn't higher for the Frost Hearts, just off the top of my head, is that the Frost Hearts uh, have less initiative. So on the idea on the tabletop is that the younger Phoenix is, you know, more energetic, and so they can attack quicker than the older ones. But the older ones are hardier and can do more damage. I think that's kind of the general idea of the Frost Heart and the Flame Spire Phoenixes and the differences between the two. And the idea that the Frost Heart Phoenix knows it can't come back, so it will fight extra hard just to keep itself alive. So in terms of special rules, the Frost Heart Phoenix has Blizzard Aura, which is an aura around itself that causes enemy units to lose a point of strength. A direct translation of that in Total War Warhammer 2 would be a drop of weapon strength around this aura. Now that would be fun, but I think with the Frost Heart, there's a little bit more creativity that, well, Creative Assembly can take with it, and maybe give what they've did to the Chill Geist and give a slowing aura around it as well, so it can catch things, it can help other units catch things. That would be a slight, that would be an interesting interpretation of that rule. As I mentioned, it has the natural armor with the ice forming around it that make it a bit hardier. It causes terror because it's still a scary large bird of ice. And it also would take a, a check every turn in terms of its varying stats. But as I mentioned with the Flame Spire Phoenix, I don't think that rule will be directly implemented into Total War Warhammer 2. It's just an element of randomness that's not really necessary. So that's the Frostheart Phoenix. Like the other Phoenix, Anoint of Assyrian can mount it but everyone else shouldn't really be able to, and it can be deployed by itself as a unit. So we've seen it before, as I've said, with the hero unit being able to use it as a mount, but also it appearing as a unit in its own right in recruit tabs. So that is the Frostheart Phoenix. Next up, we have dragons. Now, most of the dragons of Ulfwan are located in Kalidor. There are less than there used to be, but the dragons are still a force to be reckoned with. The High Elves would have been wiped out millennia ago if it wasn't for the help of their long-term allies, the dragons. So there's a huge reverence for dragons within Elven society. They have this special relationship with dragons. And although they aren't numberless like they once were in millennia gone by, they are still called upon to help defend the Elven people. Now, all dragons cause terror, and all dragons have dragon fire. Now, the difference between elven dragons and perhaps other dragons of the Warhammer world is that there are different tiers of elven dragons. So they've categorized dragons as sun dragons, who are the youngest dragons, the most rash dragons. 
And then they grow into moon dragons. And then moon dragons become star dragons. And star dragons are the big bad, the eldest of the eldest. They can take down a greater demon if they want to. That's the skill of the heart of the star dragons. Now, they get increasingly stronger and better and more attacks and more stats as you go along that progression. And it'll be interesting to see if in Total War Warhammer 2, if you get a dragon as a mount whether they maybe change hue because there is meant to be an idea of a color change as they get older as well the sun dragons being particularly red and that sort of meant to change into sort of blues and greens and what have you as they get older i think that's the idea because i've only ever seen the sun dragons painted red but maybe that's just the way that i've seen them painted and people just appropriate it because of the name but yeah they have breath attacks but we've seen dragons in total war warham before in previous videos i've said i would like the breath weapon of the dragons to be not just a an animation that happens from time to time but an actual selectable skill we have breath spells we have breath items allow me to make best use of my dragon's breath and they, and target it at units the way I'd like to because on the tabletop you get the breath template which is this kind of tear shaped template that you'd place over units and that's how that'd be effective so it's not unlike the triangular breath uh, template you have when you're casting spells in Total War Warhammer so I'd like to see that implemented for dragons in this game uh, and particularly maybe a bit more attention paid to dragons fighting other dragons and maybe just the animations of dragons in general because the high elves they love their dragons but you know we've seen dragons in the game before nothing terribly new so that's dragons for you next up we have artillery and this is going to be a very short section guys the only artillery the elves really use are their eagle claw bolt throwers or just eagle bolt throwers they come in a variety of shapes, shapes and sizes as we know with the laferne sky cutter that is the eagle eye bolt thrower this i believe is the eagle claw bolt thrower and it has two firing modes which is interesting and i think will probably be manually selectable hopefully in total war warhammer 2 you have the one that shoots a kind of big bolt that will pierce through a soldier and then hit the guys behind them and like skewer them all shish kebab style or you have the variety where they load in six smaller bolts and that's kind of more devastating damage on a regiment rather than necessarily something like a giant so hopefully two firing modes there for the eagle claw bolt thrower which the high elves use they use this on land they use this on their ships they don't really have any other kind of artillery really so that's the artillery section for the high elves and that really brings our video to a close there guys uh, let me know about the units you're particularly excited about as i mentioned the phoenix guard are great the white lions i think will be fantastic melee fighters the sword masters and even i'm just interested in seeing a bow unit with spear and shield and seeing how that works in total War warhammer with the laferne sea guard so yeah a lot to look forward to in the high elf army they may be arrogant jerks but they could be some fun to play and uh yeah guys as always thank you very much for watching special thanks to my patrons john reese colin thomas and Matthias. and a thank you to all of you and i look forward to catching you on the next one guys